Hello witches, welcome back to Salem. Today is Ostara, and if you're watching this channel, chances are you've at least heard of this pagan holiday. It's also known as the spring equinox, that's because we enjoy equal lengths of both daytime and nighttime. Astara's roots lie in ancient festivals that mark this first day of spring. These are from cultures like Germanic cultures, Celtic, Norse traditions. Modern pagans might celebrate Astara by decorating eggs, planting seeds in the ground, things that symbolize renewal and rebirth. But celebrating the first day of spring isn't always such a bright affair. So today, let's explore five darker tales from folklore and history involving the first day of spring. The transition from winter to spring is often personified by way of a mythic figure. And some of these figures are worshipped to this very day. So let's start with one of these, perhaps the best known, Baba Yaga. Now in the rich tapestry of Slavic folklore, perhaps no figure is as well known and as enigmatic as Baba Yaga. This formidable entity straddles the line between benevolence and malevolence. She embodies simultaneously the death grip of winter and the renewal of spring. And her name actually exemplifies this perfectly. Baba is derived from Slavic languages and it's basically a term of endearment for a grandmother, while Yaga roughly translates to evil woman or serpent. So this dichotomy at the core of her name reflects Baba Yaga's dual nature. She is simultaneously a child devouring hag that would be horrific to see and also the gatekeeper to profound wisdom and aid. And while we're on the subject of what it might be like to see Baba Yaga, let's talk a little bit about how she's often depicted in folklore. Generally, you find Baba Yaga residing in a hut that is peculiarly positioned on chicken legs. This hut is located deep in the forest, and that is the realm that she commands with unnerving authority. This hut is always spinning, it's always elusive, and it serves not only as her dwelling, but also as a portal between worlds. And this function as a portal between worlds is necessary to understand Baba Yaga's function as a gatekeeper between realms. She's a guardian of various thresholds, and she's often seen flying through the night in a giant mortar, wielding a pestle, sweeping up her tracks behind her with a broom. The very image of this in the mind evokes to me witchcraft, the arcane, mastery over the elements. Her appearance is said to be completely nightmarish. She's a gaunt figure, she has iron teeth, she has a nose that sometimes touches the ceiling when she sleeps, and she has a voracious appetite for the flesh of the unsuspecting. But what does all this have to do with the first day of spring? Well, the lore surrounding Baba Yaga gains particular significance around this time of year. A little flavor I really like in the Baba Yaga tale is that when we talk about the oncoming spring and we plant seeds in the soil, something that you don't really think about unless you have your hands actually in that soil, is that the earth itself is thawing. This would especially be true in the Slavic cultures from which the legend of Baba Yaga comes. And the feeling of the earth thawing after a long frost is one of breathing, of being alive, suddenly being able to sink your fingers into the earth. And a lot of the folklore surrounding Baba Yaga and the first day of spring has to do with this feeling of life stirring. This is a period of transition, and if it's unpredictable, it might not exactly be a nice transition. For if you don't do what Baba Yaga wants you to do, she just might extend her icy grip and push winter out even farther. Tales depict her wandering through the forest, snatching unaware souls, and ushering cold snaps in her wake to remind everyone just who really has the power in this transition. So what do we do about the figure of Baba Yaga roaming in the last days of winter and the first day of spring? We defeat her. Baba Yaga's defeat, last day of winter and the first day of spring, or her appeasement, is seen as something that is essential in order for spring to fully emerge. This struggle, whether symbolic or literal, represents the ongoing cyclical relationship of death and life of birth and decay. Oftentimes in legends surrounding Baba Yaga and the first day of spring, a hero 
must emerge in the tale whose cleverness will thwart her advances and usher in the first day of spring. This highlights our connection as humans to the cycles of the earth. Now this may all sound terrible and bleak, but Baba Yaga is actually somewhat of a study in contrast, which is a theme we're going to be coming up against a lot in this video. She's not purely evil. There are many tales in which she is willing to grant aid to anyone who is brave or courageous enough to seek her out. This aid could be knowledge, it could be magical gifts, it could be crucial assistance in a time of need. And if you're looking for a modern pagan analog to align with Baba Yaga, it would definitely be in this respect the crone. This is a woman who you do not want to cross, but if who you get on their good side, can grant you great wisdom. Baba Yaga has complete mastery over the mundane and she can help you have it too. Her domain in the forest and the skies, in relationship with the people in the forest, the creatures in the forest, all of these really cement her status as a personification of nature itself. She is wild, she is untamed, she is dangerous, she is unforgiving, but she is also integral to the cycle of life itself. To me, this is the most inspirational aspect of Baba Yaga's appearance on the first day of spring. It's a reminder that what is born will die, and what has died will be born again. Through her folklore, Baba Yaga encapsulates a cyclical nature in both the natural world and in our own lives. And on this first day of spring, what Baba Yaga reminds me is that nature has the power to both create and destroy. So be careful what seeds you put in the ground because you will reap what you sow. But Baba Yaga is by no means the only figure in folklore who represents the dual nature of winter leading to spring. Another can be found in the alpine folklore of Frau Percht. Frau Percht is terrifying. She again embodies a dual nature, but this time it's of winter itself. On the one hand, she is benevolent, she awards prosperous gifts. On the other, she's merciless, cruel, and will destroy anyone who defies the traditions and taboos of winter. The Pershtin, or her followers, are said to be basically demonic. They descend onto the Alps with the onset of Yuletide. And their presence alone is enough to instill fear, but it's actually Frau Pershts appearance in this story that brings the true terror. If you thought coal in the stocking was a little bit cruel for naughty children, check this out. If you happen to be a naughty child in the Alps, when Frau Perst comes to visit, you can expect such wonderful gifts as having your entrails removed and then having your now empty torso filled with straw and rocks and human refuse. So if you're a child in the Alps, not working as hard as you should be working in the harsh winter months, not following your parents' orders, obeying the traditions of your local community, you can expect Frau Perst to make you pay for it. Another really fascinating aspect of Frau Perst is her development over time. Frau Perst was initially viewed as a beautiful goddess, and this is where we see her placement in the first day of spring. Initially, this beautiful version of Frau Perst oversaw this transition, but as the centuries rolled on, this more nightmarish appearance of Perst began to appear in folklore. And a lot of this has to do with a story that we've heard many times here in the West, the Christianization of pagan mythology. The blending of these cultures and the resulting myths that came from it ultimately led Frau Perst to be known as the Christmas Witch. And while her role may on its surface sort of sound like a Krampus figure, her association with the wild hunt actually makes her more complicated. Frau Perst is kind of peculiarly connected to geese and swans. What I found really fascinating about her association with geese and swans is that it really reveals how the people who initially revered her legend, saw her. Geese and swan are really connected with beauty and loyalty and all of these things really contrast uh, pretty significantly with how we look at Frau Perst in folklore today. All of this really suggests to me a kind of largely forgotten benevolence where what was really great and beautiful about a pagan god form was turned into something terrible and horrifying to scare children when it was Christianized. Pretty sure I've heard that story elsewhere. 
Purser is also viewed as the leader in the Wild Hunt, which is basically a ghostly procession through the night. And here we see something that is emerging as a theme in these dark tales, and we will come up against it again, a guardianship over the thresholds between realms, specifically life and death. Now, thankfully, recent academic and cultural interest in Frau Perst is starting to dispel this idea that she is a figure to be purely feared. In that region, there is a traditional parade called the Perstenlauf. Uh, apologies for pronunciation on that. Everything before this and everything after this. And this parade features figures wearing masks representing the followers of Frau Perst. And this to me indicates that in that region, at least, there is a growing appreciation for Frau Perst's dual nature as the Christianized figure of terror and the pagan figure of beauty. And what better dichotomy to take into the first day of spring. The terrors of winter are ending and the beauty of spring is coming. What I'm carrying forward from the legend of Frau Perst in this first day of spring is a reminder that it is important to pay attention to tradition and the way things are done. It's equally important to recognize that traditions change over time for good reason. Her darker aspect inspires in me a reminder of the virtue of hard work and the hesitation toward venturing totally in the dark off the beaten path without at least some idea of where you're going. We've talked a lot about dark and light thus far. Now let's explore a legend that's filled with a little bit more color. I remember very fondly my first exposure to Hindu mythology as an undergrad in a religious studies class. I was captivated, entirely captivated, by the folklore that I saw represented in the pages of a textbook, colorful illustrations, vibrant celebrations, and an ever-present mix of the mystical with the moral. Even in this complicated tableau of mythology, Holika or Holika stands out. The legend of Holika is really interwoven with the celebration of Holi. This is a vibrant festival and it is celebrated with the onset of spring. It's known as the Festival of Colors, but like a few other traditions we've encountered around this time of year, there's some darkness at its core. A story that predates the colorful revelry by centuries carries with it a lesson of morality, faith, and the eternal struggle between good and evil. So let's talk about this figure who, from this point forward, I'm going to endeavor to pronounce Holika. Holika is the sister of a demon king. And this demon king had a boon that made him virtually indestructible. Of course, he grew arrogant. He began to demand that everyone worship only him. Now his son becomes a fervent devotee of Vishnu and refuses to worship his father. So then the demon king begins to try and kill his own son. Many times he fails over and over again because the son is actually protected by this unwavering devotion to Vishnu. Now, in his final attempt to kill his son, the demon king enlists the help of his sister Holika. Now, something that's really important about him enlisting her is that she was actually immune to fire due to a boon that she had received. So the plan was for Holika to carry the sun down into a fire, exploit her immunity to this element, and burn the sun alive. However, when Holika descended into the flames, they burned her because she had used the boon for malicious intent. As a result, she was completely engulfed by the flames and the sun emerged unscathed. The moral undertones of this myth have to do with the victory of good over evil, but also crucially, the terrifying lengths to which evil will go to assert dominance no matter who gets hurt in the process. So the burning of Holika is commemorized on Holy's Eve. And this event is connected with the idea of burning away evil. The next day, once this evil has been burnt away, people celebrate by smearing each other in colors. And this symbolizes the virtues of life, the joy of life, and the ultimate winning of the good. In a lot of Hindu cultures, it's a day in which the norms of society are inverted. For one, Brief moment, rigid structures of caste, of gender, of status, of age, all of these things are completely dissolved in the name of festivity. People throw colored water, they throw powders, they engage in playful banter. So on the surface, this celebration doesn't look dark, but when you dive into its underbelly, 
there's some messed up stuff down there. Now, Holy's alignment with the first day of spring is not a coincidence. It marks a time of renewal, spring does, where nature itself seems to transition from the death of winter to the life of spring. This cyclical regeneration, which is a story we are by now very familiar with, depicts the triumph of life over death in spring, of good over evil, of the burning away of the dark. And the festival's timing with the spring equinox underscores this thing because now the dark is literally equivalent to the light, and tomorrow the light's gonna be a little bit stronger. If you entertain the mythology on face value for a second, the legend of Holika and her demon king brother and his son is pretty freaking terrifying. It's filled with family betrayal, attempted murder, divine intervention to stop a great evil from occurring to an innocent person. And so to me, when I look at this legend on the first day of spring, what I'm reminded of is the ever going struggle between good and evil, light and dark, warmth and cold, not just in the world, but in our own hearts. The legend of Holy Ka reminds me that there is really only one way to have true resilience in the face of abject evil, and that's faith. Faith in the triumph of virtue, faith in devotion to ideals that we feel are higher than ourselves. And all of this is beautifully wrapped in the guise of a festival filled with colors and brightness and the temporary ceasing of societal norms. And frankly, I think we could all do with a little bit more of the ceasing of society's norms and standards. From the earthly concerns of family and betrayal, we now venture higher into the tree of life and lower into stranger realms. This is the Sumerian tale of the descent of Inanna. The ancient Sumerian poem, The Descent of Inanna, is a wildly vivid narrative. It begins with the central figure Inanna's decision to leave her celestial abode and venture into the underworld. This journey is compelled by something that I relate to very, very strongly. It's an almost mysterious, inexplicable draw toward the great below, indicating an irresistible impulse to explore and confront the darker aspects of existence. The initiation of her descent is marked with preparation it involves adornment with symbols of divine authority. Yet, as she approaches the gates of the underworld, she's forced to relinquish these one by one. This happens at each of the seven gates that she passes through. And when we talk about the power of myth and these old stories to inform our present, this next bit is just something that I feel is so resonant to modern life. This stripping away of each of these adornments as she descends farther and farther through these gates signifies not only the removal of her symbols of power, but also a profound stripping away of her ego and her identity. This leads to her having to confront the unknown, confront the darkness, confront the void, purely vulnerable and purely mortal. At each encounter, at each gate, she is compelled to surrender possessions. And you could look at this as a sort of initiatory trial, or you could have the interpretation that I've got, which is really that there's a metaphorical undertone going on here involving the stripping away of the ego and the will in order to face one's deepest fears. And the terrifying conclusion of that analysis is that it is only through surrendering to forces beyond our control, accepting our own finiteness our own weaknesses, our own vulnerabilities, that we can truly face our own death, the underworld, the unknown, the void, what have you. So the tale goes on. And upon entering the throne room, now naked and bowed, Anana's confrontation with death is immediate and visceral. The Queen of the Dead enacts a death sentence on Anana and turns her into a corpse. This moment, this full descent now into death itself, Inanna's utter annihilation represents a point where her power seems to have been completely diminished, where her light has been extinguished. Yet, it is from this point of utter annihilation, utter darkness, utter void, that rebirth is finally possible. 
This death moment in the narrative can be seen as the darkest point before the dawn, and that is emblematic of the winter solstice leading into the spring equinox. And the themes in this story of death and life, of the cycles of ego and transcendence, all of these to me speak to the first day of spring, the moments that came right before it and the ones that come after it. What actually leads us to change? Is it waking up one day and deciding we want to be different? If it actually worked like that, I don't think the self-help industry would be doing as well as it's doing. No. The truth is, and we all know this I think on some fundamental level, is that if you want to dramatically change who you are, you gotta go into the dark. You have to allow for the death of the things that led you to become who and what you are now in order to be reborn as something new. The old you has to die. And on this first day of spring to embrace the spirit of Inanna, what do you need to wander into the dark to discover? What is at the core of the things that you want to change about yourself? Is your relationship the problem or are the aspects of yourself that got you into that relationship in the first place the problem? Is your job the problem or is the way that you view yourself that would allow yourself to accept that job in the first place the problem? Inanna reminds me that there is always a darker space in which the truth dwells hidden and that at any moment with enough bravery and courage and support from the people around me, I can venture into that dark and find what's there. It'll probably hurt. I'll probably discover things about myself I wish I didn't know, but it's only through that discovery that I can do anything about those things. So I say on this day and in this spring, Anana would have us embrace our fears, descend into the unknown, and come back better for it. Descending from the light-bound realms to the dark, life, death, warmth, cold, the story of the first day of spring is emerging as a whiplash of contrasts. And the best of these tales thus far have reminded us of the ephemeral nature of it all, the seasons, the, the flora, the, the weather, and even our very lives. Our final tale reminds us of these things as well. This is from Welsh mythology. This is the tragedy a bloat of it. Imagine yourself nested in the lush landscape of medieval Wales. There's a story here found in a revered collection of mythological tales, a story which unfurls every spring, and it whispers warnings of beauty's fleeting nature and the shadows that are cast by betrayal. This is the tale of bloat of it. And again, Apologies for pronunciation. Bloduvet is a woman not born of a woman, but born of flowers. She's created by a magician in order to be a wife of another figure in the story. And again, she is another figure, like others on this list, who represents the beauty yet perilousness of this time of year. This is Snowdonia National Park. Just looking at this landscape to me evokes a sense of nature whispering ancient secrets, stories held in the very stones. Our story begins with a figure who I will call Lou. Lou is cursed by his mother to never marry a human. In defiance, a magician conjures a wife for Lou, drawn from the very nature of spring itself. This all gives life to Blow de Bed, whose beauty is meant to mirror the splendor of spring. As seasons change, though, so does the heart. Blow de Bed's eyes begin to wander in this story to a figure named Gron, and Gron is a warrior of the land. Now their love ignites a tale which ultimately spells doom for Lou. The new lovers scheme to rid themselves of Lou. And diverting from the story for just a second, this is the first bullet point into the meaning of this story in connection to spring. The great power behind the season that has this general feeling of creation also harbors destruction. An example of this would be you know, April showers bring May flowers. Well, April showers also sometimes have tornadoes in them and everybody loses their homes. But there's more to this story than a reminder that the energy behind spring is used both for creation and destruction by the natural world. There's also a really dark reminder that oftentimes the roots of treachery lie in desire. Okay, bullet point over, let's get back to the story. So the tale reaches its climax when Lou, who has been betrayed at this point, transforms into an eagle and soars away. What about Blodeved? Well, her fate was to become an owl. Now you might at first 
raise an eyebrow at that, but let's for a second think about what an owl's existence is like. Owls are shunned by the daylight. For a creature who is literally made from spring daylight and flowers, that's a pretty harsh punishment. They're also shunned by other birds. They're solitary creatures. And so this all really represents the transformation of Blodoved from a creature of the day to a creature of the night. As for Lou, he becomes a human again and reclaims his lands. Now the moral version of this story might first appear to be woman wants other man, woman gets punished for wanting other man. But I think it's actually more complicated than that because at the heart of this story there's really a death of innocence more than anything else. What is beneath your desire. We've talked about dissolving the ego in favor of going into the darkness to find something that is as of yet unknown but might actually allow you to be free. But consider for a moment what you want in the first place and why you might actually want it. What would happen if you actually got it? Would the very nature of attaining the thing you want transform you into something you're not? Spring is a time for growth and beauty to be sure, but it's also a time for flowering desires that will carry us through to Samhain or the end of the pagan year. But where do these desires come from? What might they make us into if we were to have them? And why do you want them in the first place? This story and this time of year remind me to question things because it very well may be that the thing that seems made of flowers and spring today, the desire which calls you, is the very same thing that will make you into something you never wanted to be. Thanks so much for checking out this video. My name's Joel. If you like what you see here, please let me know by liking and subscribing to the channel. Leave a comment below, perhaps your favorite spring myth or tradition surrounding Astara, some ritual that you like to do. Stay weird, witches. I'll see you next time.